channel open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions podcast network and presented in partnership with TrekCore.com. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on November 12th, 2022, and is current through the Star Trek Prodigy episode, All the World's a Stage, so beware of spoilers. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a regular news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are five television shows in production, possibly more on the way, and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me and I'll help you sort the real facts from lots of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone, and my guest this week is returning guest and co-host of the First Flight podcast right here on the Tricorder Transmissions Network. It's Abby Summer. Abby, welcome back to Weekly Trek. Thanks, Alex. It's always a blast to be here and talk Trek with you. All right, Abby. Well, you know the drill. I want to know something that's got you feeling good about Star Trek at the moment. What's got you moving at Warp 10? All right. So I have probably my favorite thing that's making me happy of Star Trek this whole year so far. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. And it's a very personal one, but it's given me a bright light in a uh, a very busy and dark time around here. So I have two young girls and we watch Prodigy together and they love it and they are into it. But my youngest one is the one who I'm pretty sure is going to end up watching every episode with me and obsessing. Like we just have that, that vibe. So we're watching the latest episode of Prodigy sitting on my couch on Thursday night. And as soon as it finishes, she goes, mama, stay right there runs into the other room, pulls out an issue of Star Trek Explorer magazine that I have on the shelf that has a feature of of Prodigy in it, flips through and goes, here's my crew. And then she keeps flipping and she goes, hold on, hold on, hold on. Gets to an article about Kate Mulgrew, sees an actual photo of Kate Mulgrew and goes, yeah, there's real Janeway. And then flips one more page and then goes, (sighs) And there's my Janeway. <laughs> I, I teared up like my heart was full. She looked at me and she just smiled this beaming smile. And that was so perfect as a Star Trek fan, as a mom. Like this is what Prodigy was aiming to do. And it happened in front of me with no prodding. And she has not put that magazine down. She slept with it the other night. She's into it. So this has been such a powerfully moving experience for me to get to share with my kids. And that is a perfect moment that whenever I'm feeling down will always make me happy. That is amazing. (laughs) I love that. It just doesn't get better. Yeah, no, absolutely. Your indoctrination is working, Abby. Congratulations. (laughs) Well, if that's my indoctrination, then it good good i hope yeah right exactly yeah 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 there are way worse things to be indoctrinating your kids into (laughs) absolutely all right let me give you mine uh which is also just kind of a personal one this week as well because we've been off the last couple of weeks because there's not been a ton of news it's been kind of a quiet period but for anybody who follows me on twitter you will know that i have been well for 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 as long as twitter remains with us i have been (laughs) Uh, in the middle of my latest rewatch of the Star Trek franchise, yes. I did the last big one I did was for the 50th anniversary. And so the 55th anniversary was last year, last summer. And I said, I'm going to do it again. And so I started in August of last year with Enterprise and have run now all the way through the conclusion of Star Trek Nemesis. And in previous years, that's where it would have ended, right? I'm doing mm-hmm. it in sort of chronological order, beginning with the earliest show, Enterprise. When I did it in 2016, I did it in production order. So I began with TOS and ran all the way through. Then Enterprise was the end. But this year, I decided I was going to do it in franchise chronological order. So started with Enterprise. And I've done this before a few times. And then the the end point is Nemesis, right? That's the, that's the kind of last chronological movie slash TV show. It happens after Endgame and then there's nothing that comes after. And that had been for all of the times that I had done yeah. this, the end of the road. And then it was a choice of, all right, do I go back to the beginning and start all over again? Or do I go do something else? But this is the first time I've done this where it's not the end. 
and there is more for these characters you know like uh so i was watching endgame uh which is the second to last episode of the old version of the franchise rewatch right you watch endgame mm-hmm. end of voyager and then you watch nemesis and then it's done yep. and at the end of endgame you know you're sort of feeling like i want to see more of these characters right i want to know what happened to them after they got home you get just that tiniest snippet of admiral janeway in star trek nemesis and that's it but now i've got lower decks to look forward to <laughs> and i'm in the middle of season one right now i've got prodigy then coming up where i get a bunch more janeway i've got picard then coming up where i've got seven of nine and then rounded out with the far future star trek discovery seasons three and four so this is the first time i've kind of gotten to star trek nemesis and it has not been sort of a, a soft landing with a bad movie ending off a terrific kind of franchise run it's sort of the these are the voyages of the star <laughs> trek franchise chronological <laughs> rewatch and it's it's nice it's great right like i got to the end of d space nine and i was like oh well i actually have you know i get to see more kira and quark coming yeah. up in a couple of seasons when i get back there with lower decks i get to the end of voyager and i get to see janeway and i get to see seven of nine and i get to see chakotay again uh, i get to see more of the tng characters right i get more yeah. Riker and troy in lower decks and then i get them again in picard and i get more data in picard and q in Picard so there's obviously this additional kind of rich depth to watching your way through the franchise that exists today that was not present in 2016 and it's just it's really nice and it's nice that there's more and it's nice there's more Star Trek coming and I sort of am going to have this interesting point where I think I'm going to hit Star Trek Prodigy season 1B in my rewatch before the season itself is finished so I'll be moving on to the next thing without having quite closed out the season but hey that's the beauty of there being new episodes pretty much every week. So that's what's got me feeling good about Star Trek this week. That's fabulous. That's just, it's it's amazing. And I know people are calling this the Latinum age now, but it almost feels like, you know, this is the road that's been under construction for so long and was barricaded off. And you keep looking at it going, is it done yet? Is it done yet? And now it is. And you have this giant, beautiful new expanse to play around it. And yeah, we are so lucky right now. And I love that you watch the franchise all the way through in in different ways. And I love that it took you longer than the year that you were celebrating (laughs) to do it now. (laughs) A lot longer. I mean, I think it, I, I'm not sure if I'll finish in 2022 or not, but at the top of it, so I've been ranking them. And then I, every time I finish a season, I update the rankings on Twitter and the like header is, you know, Alex's Star Trek franchise rewatch. And first of all, it was like 2021 and then it was (laughs) 2021 slash 2022. And now I'm wondering, will it be 2021 dash 2023 before I <laughs> yeah. finally finish it out. And it's not like I have, you know, like I, I have kind of paused for watching a few other things. I watched all of the Marvel Netflix shows. I watched The Good Place for the first time. And I so I, I did kind of have a few pauses along the way. But I definitely have been, you know, I have been mainlining Star Trek now for about 18 months, and which is a terrific thing, you know, <laughs> I don't wish to imply otherwise, but it still took me a year and a half to do it. Yeah. And I think it's it's funny that you mentioned you paused in there because you know what we get to have lives and other interests too, but how cool that your your main dose for so long has been different episodes of something you love. Yeah, it's been a really nice accompaniment for the last year and a half. And I'm actually going to be sad when it's over. I, I hesitate to go back and start all over again because it was an 18 <laughs> month commitment. But it's like, but in some ways, I just I want to just go back and start all over again, because it's just, you know, it's it's fun. And I enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe do it a different way this time. Yeah, right. All right. Well, with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on. and I'm a reporter. Well, Star Trek Prodigy has received a nomination for Outstanding Animated Series in the very first Children and Families Emmy Awards due to be held next month. The series was nominated alongside City of Ghosts, The Cuphead Show, Proud Family, Louder and Prouder, and A Tale Dark and Grim. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences has spun off the Children and Families Emmy Awards from the Daytime Emmy Awards this year for the first time in order to focus exclusively on family-friendly programming. The Emmy nomination is a prestigious one for the Star Trek franchise, which typically only receives Emmy recognition in the technical categories. That certainly has been the history of live-action Star Trek in the Evening Time Emmy Awards. And Star Trek Prodigy is not the only franchise connection for the inaugural Children and Families Emmy Awards. Announced earlier this year, LeVar Burton will be 
receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award at this year's ceremony. Abby, are you excited about the nomination of Star Trek Prodigy for Outstanding Animated Series Emmy Award? Absolutely. I mean, I think it deserves it for so many reasons. And if for no other reason, then it is such a beautiful show. So I'm hoping that it gets some some nods from some of the, the higher ups and the other creatives for that, because this show is absolutely stunning. I don't personally own one of the big fancy 4K TVs, but I happen to see this on one of those at someone else's house. And it kind of makes me want to have one now because it is that (laughs) gorgeous. And the stories match the visuals and the score is beautiful. And so you package all that up and you have something that is just the perfect little gift. And how cool would it be if Star Trek won the first one when it spun off like this? That would just be a great way to start it. And I would also like to throw out there a little mention about LeVar because LeVar Burton has been since I was little, somebody who has been been in my life and he is a personal hero and I love the fact that he loves two of the things I do Star Trek and children's literacy and so I could not think of a better person to be honored with a lifetime achievement award because he's still out there doing it and he has said you know he plans to do it until the day he dies to be out there making sure that kids can read and have access to books so thank you very much LeVar you deserve the award. Yeah this is wonderful I mean you know Star Trek Prodigy is wonderful and a wonderful show and we have like two stories this week on Prodigy so we'll talk plenty about our reactions to the season so far but it's a great show I'm really really pleased that it has gotten this Emmy nomination and it's great that it's an Emmy nomination for the kind of thing that it should be nominated for which is not like outstanding animation style or outstanding sound mixing or outstanding sound editing for a 22 and a half minute episode right like nope (laughs) it has been nominated for Outstanding Animated Series, which is Mm -hmm. great and well-deserved and the kind of recognition that Prodigy should be getting. And hopefully, right, like, obviously we are seeing this show have a high degree of popularity among younger viewers. And, like, I think this kind of Emmy nomination, and certainly if it wins, will, you know, help continue to kind of push Star Trek on children. That sounds really bad, but I mean... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we want them to mainline it too, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, that is both what I meant and not what I meant at the same time, right? Like, but I mean, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not cutting this out. I'm going to spread the gospel of Star Trek to more willing children who, you know, w- w- would really love this show, but haven't had the opportunity to kind of experience it yet because it's on Paramount Plus and, you know, exactly. it, it, it is there for a, a little, you know, y- you have to have Paramount Plus in order to watch it. So, you know, I think there's a ton of really positive stuff there. And I hope that this is just the start of a really long run of success for Star Trek Prodigy among Emmy Awards for children's and family programming and that, you know, that that sort of, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, I think it was a year ago when Prodigy first aired, they kind of talked about this vision for Prodigy as a little bit of a franchise in and of itself, right? And and look at expanding that and we've had the video game that was just released last month and we've got the action figures still hopefully coming before the end of this year and we have the books coming out early next year, but they Yep. talked about an animated prodigy movie and they talked about spin-offs and like i am hoping that with this level of positive attention on the show that there will be that kind of continued energy and momentum towards you know building out the prodigy universe because it's terrific and i want to spend as much time there as possible me too well in more prodigy news zero actor angus imry talked to trekcore.com about the character and particularly the recent borg episode let sleeping borg lie about zero's motivation in that episode imry said quote a massive motivator to zero is the fact that they were used as a weapon on Tars Lamora by the Diviner. They hold on to that, so when they expose themselves to the Diviner in A Moral Star Part 2, it's this great moment for them to experience justice, and yet it's complicated by the fact that Gwyn catches sight of them. The last thing Zero ever wants to do is to harm anyone, and so I think we see in this episode with Zero's encounter with the Borg their real determination to make up for that, to make amends, to protect their family, their prodigy crew. Imri also talked about how he brought Zero's vocalizations to the character, which were not included in the original script. Those sorts of things were not in the script ever. They were kind of my invention, he said. 
Zero doesn't have breath, you know, and that's quite a challenge as a voice actor because everything is all about the breath when you're trying to explore. So my understanding is that Zero sort of listens to other people's expressions of joy or expressions of laughing, that kind of exhalation, and makes a kind of attempt at what they might be. For some reason, they've come out as yip yips and it's become who that <laughs> character is, you know. So we see Zero does, I think, feel, but they're not quite sure how to express that vocally. It's a kind of learned behavior, but very peculiar in and of itself. And what was it like to utter the iconic phrase, resistance is futile? Quote, you just have to relish those moments, Imri said. That's the fun of being part of the Star Trek series, is the way that everything feeds into one another, and you feel part of this wonderful body of storytelling that's been so influential in people's lives. And it's no good being scared of it. You've got to dive in, and it was quite fun being Zero, who was assimilated by the Borg. Abby, what's been your reaction to Angus Imri's performance as Zero in Star Trek Prodigy? Hoot, hoot. <laughs> <laughs> I had to because we say that all the time now. And Zero is a fascinating character. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten the stare from one of my kids and I'm like, what are you looking at me for? And they're like, I'm Zero. I'm reading your mind. Like, what a cool thing for kids to think about and explore and wonder about. And one of the things that I really like about Zero this season, and especially in this episode, is they're exploring in a children's show the feeling of guilt, which is something that everybody feels and kids yeah feel a lot. I mean, they unintentionally do stuff all the time and then intentionally do stuff. And then how you wrestle with that and how you talk through it with the people who you may have unintentionally or intentionally harmed and how it doesn't go away and that carries through and it changes relationships, but it can also deepen relationships. That is such a powerful message and such a hard lesson to learn because you have to experience it. But to have this as a template of somebody who you know and admire and someone who's got so many other skills, but still has this feeling of guilt, but is working through it and processing it. And to hear Zero talking to the Borg and talking through all of that, that would normally be an internal monologue, that was brilliant. And I cannot say enough about the performance of Zero. It's nuanced, it's emotional, but at the same time, analytical. What a cool character and what a great performance so far this season. And what a great first three episodes, right? Yeah. I mean, they, they have been so good, each of them in different ways. I think this is the first episode, I think the last episode of Weekly Trek I did, it, we were still in Lower Deck Season 3 and Prodigy Season 1B had not yet started. So this is the first opportunity to like actually talk about the episodes itself. I mean, the Borg episode, the one that yes. Angus did this interview in connection to, was just so well done. I mean, I was kind of skeptical of it going into it, right? This idea of, oh, you know, Prodigy and the Borg, right? Like the Borg is yeah. kind of a deeply scary concept that is more adult in many ways. And I was worried about how that was going to translate to a younger audience and how they would kind of translate that to a younger audience and yet have it feel like the Borg, but not kind of, you know, sort of round off too many of the sharp edges. And at the same time, you know, given that the Borg themselves have such kind of a deep and rich history in the Star Trek franchise. You know, how are you going to do that around introducing younger viewers to this, this race that in 22 minutes behind which yeah. there is, you know, all of this backstory and all of this baggage and they succeeded handily. Yeah. It's a great episode. It's probably one of my favorite episodes of Prodigy to date. And it is scary in the right way. It's thoughtful in the right way. It builds on the existing canon of the Star Trek franchise in a way that resonates with like fans like you and me. Mm -hmm. And it allows for a continuation of these character arcs and journeys, like that journey of Zero from season 1A into season 1B, from the events of the of the mid-season premiere into now, you know, these episodes. It's just so good. And then, you know, also dwell for a second on this week's episode, you know, All the World's a Stage, right? Like what a another amazing love letter to the Star Trek franchise yes. from Prodigy, the show that theoretically could easily get away with never writing a love letter to the Star Trek franchise if it didn't want to, because that's not its, you know, that's not its mandate, that's not its remit. And yet here they are banging out some of the best kind of tributes to the Star Trek oeuvre as a whole possible. Yeah. 
And it's coming from the kids show, right? Like Mm -hmm. how incredible is that? So yeah, I mean, this season really is this, excuse me, this half season is really firing on all cylinders. And I'm very, very excited for the remaining episodes of this season. More Zero, more all of them, more Janeway, more Admiral Janeway, loving the Admiral Janeway stuff, loving the Dauntless, loving the Dauntless stuff. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a good time to be a Star Trek fan. Yeah, and jumping back for a second to what you said about the scariness being the right level for the board. My girls are right on the very low edge of being able to watch Prodigy and fully get it. So I prepped them ahead of time for the Borg. And I was like, hey, let's take some look. And this is what happens. And it was funny with and I, I was careful with what I said, but also said, you know, these guys are big and scary. But Janeway has beat them a couple of times and they were both going, oh, OK, Janeway beat them. Janeway beat them. And then when she said in the episode, let me fill you in on what I know or tell you what I know. They both went, oh, now everything's fine. Janeway's beat the Borg before. (laughs) So it was like, I I feel like I wasn't the only parent who probably did that. And I think the fact that they put that one little throwaway line in there that most of us were just like, oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was there for them. And that was on purpose and it worked. So they really straddled that line because it was still scary. But it was not too scary that they were going to bed having nightmares about Borg for the next couple of days. So right, right, right. Bravo. Yeah, just so, so well done. And then like, you know, the way that the show is continuing to layer in the sort of Star Trek-y elements is just also like really, really well done. Um, You know, bringing in the Borg, having more of the Admiral Janeway stuff, the Dauntless, Mm -hmm. like it's just all really, it's just all really well done and even the TOS stuff this week right like I, I think Jen's review on Trek Core talked about how for her kids you know a lot of the TOS references were a little bit inaccessible and that was probably more pitched at like you and me than it was at yep. her kids and your kids but at the same time right like gives them something to revisit later you know if they decide to explore the rest of the franchise and to go back to the original series to then come back to and have a new appreciation for at that point and get something new out of their own show in a way that they don't get the first time around. Yeah, they know their audience. They're layering it in for the kids and they're scooping it in for us on top as sprinkles when they need to. Exactly. Some trip tucker sprinkles or whatever the hell it was that Jen said. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Turning to Star Trek Voyager and now Star Trek Prodigy star Kate Mulgrew, there continues to be buzz about the possibility of Janeway showing up in live action. Speculation which the Janeway star herself has not completely discounted. At a fan Q&A held in Bloomington, Indiana a couple of weeks weeks ago, when Mulgrew visited the Captain Janeway statue that has been built there, she talked about her openness to revisiting the character in live action. You know, I didn't think I would, because I'm a certain age now, just as I was a certain age then, right? But I'm very strong and still full of life, and I adore this character, so why on earth wouldn't I bring her back? And she went on to lay out what she had told Alex Kurtzman were her conditions to return. I said this to Kurtzman, she said, the writing is going to have to be absolutely exquisite, and as tight, I mean so tight, sorry, I'm doing my Kate Mulgrew impression now. Uh, (laughs) I want that language to just burst and I want the story to be so tenuous and taut. I said, no languishing. I don't want peaks and valleys. I want a Janeway that everybody can say, that's what she's become. I'm with her. This is great, right? And I think some sort of extraordinary adventure, even greater than Voyager, even greater than the Delta Quadrant. Abby, would you be interested in seeing more Kate Mulgrew in live action as Admiral Janeway? Uh, Short answer, yes. (laughs) I would like to, (laughs) I would like to see Kate Mulgrew as any kind of Janeway that she would like to portray because I feel that she is so connected with this character now that if she is okay with whatever Janeway is doing, we're all going to be okay with it too. And if that means heaps more animation and live action, if that means a mix of both, if that means just a bunch of audiobooks, I would like Janeway back every way possible. And again, now that Prodigy has Janeway as that anchor, I think it's such a nice way to continue those steps for the kids like we were talking about before and if she does come back they already have that touchstone and another place to go with Voyager and then even more like a whole story a whole picture and I have to say that there was one little piece in here too because whenever you hear Kate Mulgrew and you do a very nice impression thank you you hear it in her voice and there was a little piece in here where she was talking about she'll do this that and she said but absolutely no more of those buns and (laughs) that just made me laugh too because that is so perfectly 
her and this character like no we don't have time for that anymore that was just silly and time consuming and it it makes it feel so personal to her for her to even have that little thing to say so yes please bring back Janeway (laughs) any way you want yeah I'm also on the complete absolutely yes please train on this one Uh, you know I think that obviously it's it's wonderful to have Kate in Prodigy playing two different versions of Janeway right Hologram Janeway and Admiral Janeway and now you know kind of there being a real balance in terms of that performance right where she is half the time Admiral Janeway and half the time she's Hologram Janeway but you know the difference between the two pretty easily yep and and it's funny to kind of then flash back to New York Comic Con was would that have been 2019 20 no 2020 when kate kind of announced that she was gonna be in prodigy and it was like yeah i'm gonna yeah. be in prodigy but i'm not playing you know i'm not playing the voyage janeway i'm playing a different janeway and it's like oh you know maybe i'll play the real janeway sometime again but for now i'm playing hologram janeway and it's like actually you are playing both of them and she knew that going <laughs> into it and, oh yeah but that was all part of the fun of the reveal and you know here too like i don't you know to what extent is this something that's actually happening right like is she one of the mysterious cameos in Star Trek Picard season three quite possibly right it's not necessarily yeah. outside the realm of possibility given it's currently affiliated with the franchise they filmed it last year while she was doing Prodigy she has a great relationship with Alex Kurtzman she did the man who fell to earth with him mm-hmm. like you could easily see her having snuck in and done a Janeway cameo for Star Trek Picard season three and this is all just her way of like you know trying to respond to questions but without spoiling anything but theoretically that's not happened yet and you know it is something that is still in potential offing and, and may never that happen at all and I kind of hope it does I think it would be I think it would be a, a really good tribute to Kate a really important character who and a really important actress in the franchise who is important now not just for sort of the quote unquote Berman era of the franchise but is also now important for the quote unquote Kurtzman era of the franchise mm-hmm. as well and so yeah like of course I want you know uh, Janeway back like I don't know that I want like Star Trek Janeway right like I don't necessarily think we need to go through the litany of major legacy characters and have Star Trek Picard style vehicles for each of them. I could easily see you know, Kate's involvement in a live action Star Trek show being fairly similar to her prodigy role as part of some kind of ensemble rather than being a sort of a, a, a focused vehicle for her. But if that's the direction they want to go in, that's also an interesting one. I mean, you know, they'd have to think of a different twist on it than Picard because you couldn't run the same kind of plays all over again. But uh, yeah, I mean, I am I really, really love Janeway and would love to see more of her. So yeah, more prodigy, Admiral Janeway, hologram Janeway and more live action Janeway, please. Well, and lastly this week, after disappearing from Paramount Plus in the US last month, we now know where the first 10 Star Trek movies have ended up. And if you thought the answer was back on Paramount Plus or another Paramount or CBS Alliance streaming service, sorry, you are wrong. Why would you think that? You can find the 10 Star Trek movies currently on now HBO Max as of November 1 in the United States. And this includes the Star Trek The Motion Picture Director's Edition, which was originally launched as a Paramount Plus exclusive last year. According to some reports, the HBO Max deal was a pre-existing licensing deal that predated Paramount Plus, but I'm not sure I entirely believe that given the Motion Picture Director's Edition, this version of which was newly created during the Paramount Plus era, clearly postdates any of those deals. But there we are, the home of all Star Trek isn't the home of all Star Trek for the foreseeable future. Abby, do you have HBO Max to be able to watch the original 10 Star Trek movies? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) Um, that's the answer there and this is where like if i was writing something about this i would be inserting that face palm picard gif where it's just like come on i understand previous deals i don't want to take anybody's rights or residuals or any of that away but this it's past silly into absurd at this point and it's like hopscotch and no i that's one of the streaming services I don't have and I don't have anybody's password to share and it's a good thing that I still have DVDs because at least they're consistent. (laughs) They might not be the most beautiful but they're consistent. So what a bummer because you know what? I watch Generations every Christmas because it's a Christmas movie. It's got a big old Christmas scene in it. So uh, I hope that I can pull out my DVD player and it still works so I can watch that one. Come on. 
this is silly, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I talked about this a lot, so I'm not going to belabor the point. Folks know that I think that this is ridiculous, and they just need to fix it and figure it out, or at least you know maybe climb down the you know yes, the framing for the home of all Star Trek thing is every series and every episode and not every movie, but like you did a bunch of cut together's where you were like we're the home of all Star Trek. So like mm-hmm. I also the Trek movie article that the show notes will link to is pretty defensive of Paramount, and I think that's way too much of a suck up maneuver to the <laughs> to the studio on this one like i think it's okay to just say this sucks and it's stupid especially after you said you're the home of all star trek right like i don't think it's inappropriate to call out a major multinational entertainment conglomerate for making a dumb decision and kind of selling a false bill of goods to star trek fans but that's all i'm going to say about it at this point if you want the 10 star trek movies they're over on hbo max hopefully they're not there for too long hopefully eventually they will come back to paramount plus hopefully this is a concept of uh, legacy deals that Paramount Plus was locked into and couldn't get themselves out of and that their long-term plans is at whatever point those deals expire, the 10 Star Trek movies will be back on Paramount Plus and that is where they will stay forever. Yeah, let's just find a place and stay and make it Paramount Plus. Right. Logical here, people. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right, well, we've talked about the facts and now let's speculate on what's going to happen in the future of Star Trek. You make some very good points, Captain. But it's still all speculation and theory. So each week, my guests and I give you a wish or theory we're nurturing about any of the shows or the future of the franchise. So Abby, let's hear your theory or wish for this week. All right, so I have two wishes right now this time. And the first one is a wish and maybe just a, a, a pointed reminder to the universe that Please, 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 can we get some sort of information about Mission Seattle? Because, (laughs) please? Yes, please. It's, what, six months at this point? Yes. It will be six months away. So the the convention begins May... The convention is posted to begin May Uh 26, 2023. So November 26, 2022 will be six months away. That is only... That is now uh, two weeks away from now. Yeah, it's crazy. We have to plan these things. Like, I have to take my personal days at work to be able to fly. And people need to make these decisions, especially if you're wanting to attract international people. Come on, get something out there. So... That's my my wish to the universe. Let's hope we are manifesting it by putting that out there. And my other wish, and this is probably pie in the sky or somebody who has sewing skills, you can make this happen and become rich on Etsy. But all right, we know that Murph is undergoing a transfer. What do they call it? Metamorphosis. There we go. I always want to say transformerfin or mation, and that doesn't work as well. But I would like to see and really a wish in time for it to be under my Christmas tree, a reversible Murph stuffy or plushy like they used to do with those old puppets you could Uh turn inside out and it was another one with original Murph and then you can flip it around and push it inside out and Velcro it together and then you have new Murph. Ah. So you can go through that metamorphosis with your toy and pick your preference or go back and forth. It would be so cool. Every kid I know who loves Prodigy would buy that in a heartbeat and that would make Santa's job real easy this year. So I don't know if it's even possible, but if they could launch that on, you know, StarTrek.com the day after Murph transforms, They'd sell out. Mm, I suppose it depends what Murph transforms into. I suppose it does. But uh, <laughs> I, I think that I think that it might be a possibility. And I think that it's it's just a gold mine waiting to happen. Well, yes. Uh, did you manage to get your hands on the New York Comic Con exclusive Murph? I did not. Despite some behind the scenes efforts, I did not. But I want one. There are some on eBay. They, the people started off listing them for like nutty prices, but but actually not a ton of them have moved. So the prices have come mm. down a little bit. I would recommend looking there. Okay. Uh, like I saw one posted for less than 20 bucks. Oh, good. I'm on the first wish for Mission Seattle. Thank you for being <laughs> the one to raise it because I couldn't do it again because I did it like <laughs> three weeks ago. But yes. Come on, Reed Pop. Come on, Paramount. Tell us what's going on with Star Trek Mission Sh- Seattle. It's now six months and two weeks away, and the website has not changed a jot from the last day of Star Trek Mission Chicago, where they changed the homepage to say Mission Seattle and put the dates up. But everything else about the website still says Mission Chicago. The Star Trek uh, Mission Twitter account has only tweeted once since the end of Mission Chicago to honor the passing of Nichelle Nichols, has said nothing about the show. Suppose 
supposedly there was um uh, one of the star trek mission seattle facebook groups somebody who runs one of those called read pop and was told over the phone that announcements for mission seattle would begin in early november well it's now <laughs> mid-november and we still don't have them so i mean who knows if that was actually someone who was in the know or if they were trying to just shuffle a concerned citizen off the phone as quickly as possible but like it's got to happen now right yeah. like we're six months away For the point about international is well taken right like you want to be booking your flights internationally six months out and seattle's not a cheap place to fly to at the moment right nowhere is a cheap place to fly to at the moment but getting to the west coast for folks on the yeah. east coast is very expensive obviously less expensive if you're on the west coast but and it's a holiday weekend. And it's, it's holiday a holiday weekend. Holiday it's weekend. Royal Day weekend, yes. So, like, please give us the opportunity to give us your money. And the yes. way to do that <laughs> is to let us give you our money. We are begging <laughs> to give you our money. Exactly. Please put tickets on sale. Please make hotels available. Because the other problem is, right, like, I'm normally a pretty kind of, you know, positive, optimistic person who is like, oh, well, there's a reason for everything. And of course, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do their first major official Star Trek convention and then screw up the second one so badly or cancel it or end up having to move it to a different city or a different date. But the closer we get, the more even I am like, I don't know, it feels like there's something, something is wrong here, off. right? And like yeah. something is off and this is not good and it shouldn't be that, right? Like if you know you're having a convention and you know the dates, like then shouldn't you be in a position to sell tickets, right? Like that's a passive activity. It, exactly. It's all automated people put their credit card numbers in and they receive a pdf ticket in by email right like this is read pop they have those kinds of systems and functions all in place so where is mission seattle please i am begging you tell us what's going on with this convention now because right thanksgiving right so uh, yeah six, six months out well the week before that's thanksgiving so really if we don't hear as of the week the day that this episode drops the this week well then we're not going to hear until early december and then we're within six months and we're in the christmas season which means then are we not going to hear until early january right like uh, like it's just getting and then i think if we get to january and there's no word about mission seattle even i'm going to be like well clearly this thing is worried happening. right like yeah. yeah so we may all find ourselves at the independent Long Island Star Trek convention, uh, which <laughs> is launching its inaugural convention. Uh, it's the weekend before Mission Seattle. And I believe, and they do have guests announced, and they have a hotel and they have tickets. So maybe we'll all find ourselves there rather than in Seattle at the official convention. But like, come on, Paramount, please. Let's, let's, and read pop. Let's figure this out. This is getting ridiculous. This is supposed to be your official event. Creation are better organized than you are. And you moved the thing because you thought that creation didn't have like enough imagination or vision or organization. And now this is what you come up with unbelievable okay <laughs> i agree on all counts i'll just leave it at that and maybe the day this drops there'll be a huge announcement and and we'll just be completely aging like sour milk right that is my i would like nothing more abby <laughs> yeah me too i would like nothing more than for the time that people hear that me talk about this that i have already <laughs> bought my ticket and booked my hotel <laughs> <laughs> all right i kind of don't have a wish or a theory this week i just sort of had something that i wanted to talk about a little bit which is the twitter thing uh you know, obviously for, for, for those of my listeners who are on Twitter, and that should that's probably most of you because that is where I post the most about the show. That's where I'm most active. If you ended up here, you are most likely to have ended up here through having found out about it on Twitter. So I feel like I'm talking to a mostly Star Trek Twittery audience, and therefore I'm sorry if this is completely irrelevant to you, but hey, you can just end the episode and you know, <laughs> we've done the news and that I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about everything that's been going on, which is obviously there's, you know, a ton of change and upheaval in the Twitter platform at the moment. It's been purchased by Elon Musk. He proceeded to lay off most of the staff and has all of these crazy ideas about selling check marks and verified status for $8 and 24 hours into starting to do that. So many major brands have, were impersonated and had their stock prices take a hit that they have put that on pause. And the service is clearly creaking a little bit, right, with all of the layoffs. So like when you went onto Twitter, it used to tell you how many notifications 
notifications you had. Now it just tells you that you have notifications. I've seen reliable Twitter threads that have said that that's because the function that tells you how many Twitter notifications you have is broken and there's nobody there to fix it, right? So like you can see visibly that the service itself is already starting to suffer a little bit from all of these changes and all of this upheaval. And lots of people have been looking at alternative social media platforms, some moving to Instagram, some moving to Facebook, a big migration over to Mastodon or whatever we're calling it so that people can toot away to their heart's content, which is this sort of decentralized social network that relies much more on volunteers, these sort of independent servers that you join. Anyway, I've not I've not kind of dipped my toe in the Mastodon water because it just seems very complicated and I'm and I'm not ready yet to give up on Twitter personally. I know there are lots of people, I mean some people who listen to the show who have decided I'm done uh, with Twitter for now, I'm moving on to something else and don't begrudge anybody making that decision and, and moving on and doing so. And I guess this is not sort of some pee on for where well, you should stick around or I think things are going to get better or, you know, everything's going to go back to normal because like, uh, who am I to say that? I have no idea. I have no clue whether the service will still be available, you know, two weeks from now or a month from now or six months from now or a year from now. And maybe this will all blow over and it will be and you will look back on this and just be like, Haha, we all got really afraid for a moment and that was silly we went way overboard and of course everything was going to be fine and we're still happily tweeting away about star trek two three years from now and this is all a distant memory of like just a, a period of time but this does give me an opportunity to kind of just sort of reflect a little bit on you know the ex i've been on star trek twitter now i think i i, I really started using it and I, I created an account in 2012 but i really started using twitter i think in like 2017 ish and let me tell you what what i would be without having had access to that service so I had been attending Star Trek Las Vegas since 2011. That was the very first one I went to. I went every year, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, didn't go 20 because it didn't exist, 21, 22, and I'm planning for 23. And there's the conventions before Twitter and there's the conventions after Twitter for me. The conventions before Twitter were ones in which I attended. I had a wonderful time. I met fabulous Star Trek actors. I, you know, I folks know I like to do the photo ops. I did a bunch of photo ops. I would have a terrific time sitting in panels, but I was by myself. I didn't really meet anybody. I, you know, I would talk to people in lines. I would recognize lots of people from social media. I, you know, I, I sort of used Twitter, but I didn't, but I, I just kind of read. I didn't interact. I was not a presence. And I don't mean that as in being a, a, a notable presence. I just mean that in being like, I used it with the same way that I used the Trek BBS, which was, I was a reader. I was not a participant in the conversations that were taking place. And, uh, but I didn't know anybody and I didn't really have any friends. And it was just, it was, it was sort of a solitary vacation that I went off and did by myself. And I had a fabulous time, but I did sort of feel like, you know, well, clearly there are these wonderful social and friend groups and it would be nice to figure out how to kind of, you know, make my way into them. And many people know me as being a super gregarious person who is very easy to interact with and get along with. And you're more than welcome to come up and say hi at any convention. And I promise I'm not going to make you feel like a weirdo, but that does not automatically come naturally to me. And it's something that I've had to work on quite a bit. And having that kind of community on Twitter where I have met you know, many of my, frankly, best friends and people who are extremely, extremely important to me has been really important for me over the last few years for all kinds of things, for my ability to deepen my the fun that I have at conventions, for me to deepen my appreciation that I have for this show, for me to feel more like the person that I want to be in terms of having a group of friends who are passionate about the things that I'm really passionate about and being able to kind of, you know, talk about that and communicate about that. For me to do this show. I wouldn't be doing this show if, if it wasn't for the existence of Star Trek Twitter. I never would have thought to have done something like this. And now I'm coming up on having done it for, have I done it for three or four years? See, I've been doing it so long, I don't even remember <laughs> at this point. I know I'm coming up, I'm closing in on, uh, we're closing in officially on 200 episodes for Weekly Trek, including the kind of original cruise version. Uh, and I'm not too far away from having done 200 episodes myself of this show. And none of that would have been possible without this little community that we put together. And it's very 
very sad that there is all of this upheaval and that people have decided to depart and that even if this service still exists a year, two years, five years from now, that this has happened right now because we were in a good place. I mean, yes, the community's had its issues and its problems and its problem characters and issues with misogyny and racism and all kinds of different problems that, you know, we have continued to kind of grapple with and work our way through. But for all of the bad things about the Star Trek Twitter community, there were a thousand good things and there are a thousand good things. And I would like for that to continue for as long as possible because it has been extremely important for me and for my own well-being and my own happiness and my own friendships. And it would be very sad if anything happened to it. And so I get just, uh, I suppose I don't really have a point other than just to kind of have an opportunity to say that I've really enjoyed being a member of that community over the last few years. I'm not going anywhere. I plan to be on the saucer as it crashes to the surface of Viridian 3. <laughs> that, uh, you know, they will, like the ship will explode around me style as far as my involvement with Twitter goes. But I, I just, I just kind of wanted to say, uh, reflect what I think many people are feeling, which is just that this sucks. It sucks a lot. And hopefully, you know, we get through it and it's fine and everything continues or we kind of recreate this magic of this community somewhere that's not on Twitter. Twitter. But that was a very long way of saying if any of my listeners who are active on Star Trek Twitter have been feeling sad or bad or weird about what's been having, happening with the service as a whole over the last couple of weeks, please know that you're not alone. Please know that it's not a bad thing to feel an element of investment and and strong connection to what is ultimately just a social media platform, because I feel it too. And hopefully we'll all get through this together. And that's it, I promise. That was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, that was that was beautiful. And it teared me up a little bit. And for all of the times that you say you've gone on rants on this show, <laughs> that was that was Picard level speech worthy. That was beautiful. <laughs> so and I, I, I echo that like I lurked for a while. And honestly, it was because of our friend Jim Morehouse on Trek Ranks that I found in the podcast listening that I did. And he kept saying, find us on Twitter, share your lists on Twitter. And I'm like, well, I guess maybe I should be more active on Star Trek Twitter because I love the show and I want to submit lists. And that was the gateway to this beautiful community and to friends and support and excitement. And I echo everything you said about how it feels sad and it feels just disappointing that this positive part of my life might not be there. And this time does feel different. And I, I hope, again, that things are different by the time people hear this or if they listen back in a few weeks or whatever. But if not, I, I also say thank you to all of Trek Twitter and my friends I've made there and we'll find each other. Somewhere out there, right? Hopefully at fucking Mission Chicago, uh, Mission Seattle, <laughs> Seattle. They finally yeah. get together, right? Like, <laughs> pull, pull the two wishes together. <laughs> there we go. Do you have a theory or a wish for Discovery, Picard, Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, or Prodigy that you'd like to share? Tweet them to me at Weekly Trek or email them to me at Weekly Trek at the Tricorder Transmissions.com and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all the time we've got for this episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, Abby Summer, for joining me today. Abby, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? Well, I hesitate to say this after all we just <laughs> said about Twitter, but <laughs> the best place to find me right now is at Abby M summer that's s-o-m-m-e-r on twitter i have not yet migrated either but we'll see but i also am on the first flight podcast that is coming back for season two later this month we are very excited about that and you can find the pod at first flight pod on twitter instagram facebook all the major platforms so even if twitter implodes you can find the pod and find me through there and very exciting i saw your little tweet yesterday that says season two is coming yeah big things so look for some good announcements coming out very soon. And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander T. Perry for now. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. And if you like our shows, please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you will turn to trekcore.com. Well, thank you, Abby. Thank you to all of my listeners. And until next week, live long and prosper. Prosper.